Hi, my name is David Ferbata with PrecisionAg.com and Agribusiness Global. I'm here with Jessica Chung. She's a consultant with Ipsos Research Consultancy. We're talking about drone applications of crop protection inputs, and her research focuses on Asia Pacific and how it affects labor, yields, and crop input volumes. Jessica, thank you for joining us and giving us a primer on your talk that you'll deliver at the Agribusiness Global Trade Summit later this month. Thank you, David. It's nice being with you today. So Ipsos has some market-specific data on adoption trends. I understand Japan is one of the early adopters. Can you talk a little bit about how Japan is using drone applications for crop protection and, and why they're an early adopter? Sure. So um, at Ipsos, we started looking into agriculture drone and commercial drones um, um, in the last three years. And it was because a lot of our clients are in the B2B space. We're quite interested in what are the next technology that would disrupt or influence their market. Um, for a lot of our customers or, or our clients in crop protection or in manufacturing, uh, drones was of quite high interest, but we realized it was quite a nascent market. And not, there's not a lot of case studies or examples of how it's being adopted into a lot of current markets. So we started looking into who are some of the earliest adopters of agriculture drones to understand the potential roadmaps, the potential revenue opportunities, and the potential impact to people involved in the agribusiness ecosystem. Japan is one of the most, um, er, the, Japan is the earliest adopter of agriculture drones. They, invented um, agriculture drones. The first one is a gasoline powered um, drone from Yamaha for crop spraying, and it's still being used today. Um, mainly they adopted it because of an aging population, rural to urban migration that was taking away labor from very labor intensive rice plantations, but is a staple in their country. So they found this uh, and developed this technology that was very useful to fill in the gap. Um, and that is really focused on crop protection and crop spraying. So we looked at how they adopted it and um, if it's relevant today, and that was in the late 1970s, early 1980s. Um, and today we actually see a different type of an early adopter as well. In the US, we see a lot of early adoption in a lot of remote sensing drone technology. So we have a lot of large fields in the U.S. that has existing heavy agriculture machinery that does the job of either precision crop spraying or a lot of crop spraying functions, but it's complemented by drone technology for remote sensing to understand um, how to best manage the farm. So we see the two different dynamics in the two different markets, and it really um, showcases, and we make an argument that um, agriculture drone is not monotonous. It's not a homogenous technology. We really have to understand what's the regulatory landscape, what's the requirement for the market to adopt it, how affordable is it, and who is adopting it, given the multi-stakeholders involved in the ecosystem. And, and given that, before we get into the regulatory, given that Japan has small farms that is similar to the rest of right. East Asia, do you right. see that model that Japan has created um, proliferating throughout the region um, in, in any way more so than maybe large acre farms in, in the US and Brazil or other places? That's a very good question. I think um, the models will have to look quite differently um, and it actually leads to new revenue space. So an example I'd like to give is um, Japan has fragmented rice farms, but in China and Southeast Asia, those plots can be further fragmented. Uh, whereas in the US, the scale is very different and the crops that are being grown in terms of, for example, row crops or staple crops are quite different from what is being faced in Southeast Asia and China. Um, at first glance, it can seem quite difficult to get one technology for a small plot of land. Um, something that we've seen come up is a lot of new business service models that are being hosted by third parties. So in addition to drone companies trying to have their own leasing models or distributors having their leasing models, um, we have seen a lot of digital platforms to um, connect people who want agriculture drones services with the machinery. 
so that you don't have to own the drone and operate it at an expensive cost for your small plot of land. You can have a co-op model for your co-op farm to rent it, or you can call in someone just for seasonal spraying or seasonal remote sensing. And we see this as a brand new revenue space in addition to brand new drone revenue space um, that's taking off quite quickly, especially in our study of China. And who do you feel will fill that channel? Is it the equipment dealers? Is it the manufacturers? Is it the traditional ag input suppliers? Right. So I think for each market, it really depends on the existing supply chain that's in place. Um, it's very difficult to say who should own this business model. We've seen people develop their own platforms and just be an intermediate intermediary between different multi uh, stakeholders. We have seen drone companies try to launch their own platforms and we have also seen um, how crop science companies who have already ventured into digital farming platforms see how to attach the equipment side um, to their product side. Um, as you correctly mentioned, this is very important for precision agriculture and it's very important for crop science companies to manage the efficacy of products being used through a new machinery. So um, we haven't seen a very obvious leader in the market on this yet, but we have seen the new emerging models, which is the most exciting piece. And hopefully there's some convergence in the future for us to follow. Let's talk about that emerging model. Now in Japan, are we able to quantify um, volumes of crop protection products and whether they've been affected by this new application technology through the years? Um, I think the information that we have so far doesn't track so much of the volume being used or how it's being impacted. I think the most important thing is that the efficacy is protected and it's being managed and um, crop protection products are not being misused or overused, which can be common in some developing markets where um, the labeling or the formulation or the dosage is not managed properly. Um, what we are able to identify is in Japan, for example, in rice crops, um, over 70% of farmland uses drones to spray or manage their crops at some point during the year. And that's something that we believe is a very high threshold um, for drone adoption. And we look forward to other markets. If they can reach anywhere close to that, it would have a significant impact um, to how uh, crops are being managed. And I think um, volume is definitely one piece uh, for crop protection companies, but efficacy and as well as access to new market space or new farms that haven't used certain products or haven't used um, crop protection products previously can really benefit from a new market entry for a new market technology to bring these products to the market. Now, obviously, you talked about labeling a little bit and perhaps um, innovations in formulation technology. How have crop protection companies in Japan and perhaps in China had to alter their labeling or change their formulations for this new application method? Um, at the moment, what we see is that it's still somewhat of a work in progress. Um, there is no fixed labeling on the um, application of crop protection products through Jones because there's so many types of crop protection drones being developed in the market. Um, anywhere from the drift that it has from the aircraft, from nozzle spray, from variable, um, from variable rate spraying, from oil-based, water-based, you know, when you spray it, 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 there's too many variables at the moment for a very standard labeling to uh, be produced. Having said that, there is increasing standardization in the market and people want to have a labeling, um, you know, proper labeling for drone applications quite quickly. Uh, we also see that in, in addition to the international crop science companies, there's a lot of generic products and there's a lot of domestic products um, that are being used through drones. Um, and it's quite difficult, I think, sometimes in some markets for them to understand and for users to understand that we don't need large volumes of crop protection products for them to be effective. So from adopting the technology, we see that there needs to be a little bit of uh, training 
um, and education around how the technology is going to be used. Um, and then with more standardization in the market, either from regulations or from the hardware itself, uh, then only can there be more standardized labeling from crop protection companies. But um, as you mentioned, it is being adopted in the market right now and everyone wants to create the right labeling for the products as quickly as possible so that the products are being used as effectively as possible. So aside from Japan, um, China is also quickly adopting this technology. Um, can you talk a little bit about why tech, um, it seems like the manufacturers are pushing this technology through the chain instead of a, a pull through? Talk a little bit about the, the manufacturing sophistication of China and how that's impacting applications in that country. Sure. So um, at Business Consulting, we published two papers on uh, agriculture drone um, adoption specifically. And the first one was to examine the different roads and pillars to adoption in the market um, to cover the multifaceted angles and multi-stakeholders in the ecosystem. Our second paper focuses on China, China's landscape and adoption. Um, and it's very fascinating because they supply, there's some reports that say they supply up to 70% of the world's civilian drone um, aircrafts. And you know, a big portion of that would be agriculture drones, especially for crop spraying as well. But in their agriculture sector, they have less than 1% of um, agriculture drone adoption. We find this dynamic quite interesting where you have a huge drive from the manufacturers and supply um, and there is a big push by the government to have more technology introduced into China's agriculture industry and from that push and subsidies they want to absorb a lot of the drone supply that's being available and being manufactured for the market so that it does help the local agriculture industry as well. So we see this development as quite exciting. It's not something that's seen in other markets, um, but it's pushing it at a very quick pace. I think something that China has done quite successfully for the drone industry is to bring down the cost of drone hardware um, that's available in the market, making it much more affordable. But having said that, it, you know, there is a lot of regulation areas that still needs to be developed and a lot of training around how to operate drones and how to operate drones specifically for agriculture that needs to be filled in the market. When you look at the investment uh, money pouring into um, agriculture technology in some of these markets, is it coming from private public partnerships, from public, from governments, from where, where exactly is this infrastructure coming from? I see. Um, for it really depends on the market again. Um, so definitely from China, it, it, there's a big push from the drone manufacturers, and there's also a big push from the government because of their national policy. So we see from other markets there are big push from corporations, international or local corporations, to adopt this technology because it helps with the scale of their operations locally. Um, in some markets, we see regulations. Um, quite a risk to the technology because um, it is a aircraft that is occupying a new airspace that has not been regulated before. So it can create quite a bit of a barrier. Um, so there might, although there might be push on the agriculture side from the aviation side, um, there might be a bit of room for development or room for discussion on how that how, how this aircraft and how this um, equipment should be managed to make sure people using it are the crops being sprayed or drifted elsewhere that will cause potential harm to other um, people or crops. Um, and, you know, if there was I issues with the aircraft, how, should that, how that should be managed. And I realized that after Japan and China, the next adopters are kind of far and away in their... <laughs> And curve, but perhaps can you talk a little bit about what's happening in large plantations in Philippines, in South Korea to some extent, in Indonesia? Sure. Um, so from our information so far, we understand there's quite a natural technology spillover from Japan's adoption of drones into South Korea. So they have been adopting for what we call 
um, staple crops um, such as rice or corn or wheat um, into value crops. Um, so anything that can be exported or needs to be managed with a lot of precision agriculture to maximize yield and output and value of crops, um, that, that has been adopted quite well. In large plantations, I think for uh, Philippines or a lot of uh, South uh, East Asia countries, a lot of them are quite focused on value crops because of the affordability of the equipment versus their local labor, labor and other input costs. So there's a lot of drive from um, companies or corporations or cooperatives who are focused on more value crops to maximize because they have the capital if there is no other financial structures available or subsidies available for them to subsidize the cost of drones. And I see recently in, in Thailand, in Myanmar, in places where they're seeing an army worm invasion on corn. They're starting to adopt this technology out of pure need to get uh, over the crops to, instead of, um, as an alternative to backpack spraying. Um, right. The opportunistic applications such as this helping um, different countries adopt this technology perhaps more quickly than it would in a natural business cycle? Um, I definitely think so. I think that we have to look at different conditions within a country to see what pushes it. Um, I think when there is a functional need for the technology, it will push the adoption much more quickly from the demand side. So if there is um, pests or um, certain infections or damages to crops that can't be managed effectively or quickly enough by manual labor or heavy machinery, then drones is a great solution that's already available um, that will help people adopt the technology more quickly. Um, again, having said that, aging population or rural to urban migration is a huge factor in many countries for people to want to adopt drones, um, as well as service providers, people who traditionally provide um, machinery leasing or other agronomic services may want to seek drone hardware or drone as a platform for additional services and access people who haven't used this type of information before. So Jessica, you started this conversation talking about the impetus of your research uh, for your clients heading off the disruption in the value chain, that this was going to, um, depending on the speed of the adoption curve, alter their business in a way that they had to react or start thinking about it now so that they could react when the time was right. Um, are you able to quantify a time frame in which that disruption or that adoption curve will hit the critical mass in which um, businesses will need to react or, or be disrupted? Okay, I, I think that's a very valid question and it's the million dollar question we all want to ask. Um, so I think in the first part, I'll talk about the disruption. In the second part, I'll talk about the time frame. So in terms of the disruption, we do see that drones, when we started looking into drones, it was quite a nascent um, market. We do see it ramping up in different markets and we also see it ramping up in different market segments. So I think it's very important to um, talk about what specific market segments are adopting it, who's adopting it, and which markets to understand how it's going to be disrupted. So if we talk about global disruption, I don't think um, it's going to happen as quickly. But for key markets who have a huge incentive for adoption, whether it's from the supply side or the demand side, um, I think it's also very important to recognize that what it's really disrupting is the farm management practices from a very reactive model to a proactive model where you have information firsthand, where you can um, manage the inputs of your crops earlier on, examine which areas need more precision agriculture applications, um, connect with agronomists, connect with other people who are using the technology in the community. Um, and it's really going to change people behave around understanding the farm and then from there it would likely influence how uh, manufacturers are thinking about their products whether it's their portfolio where the technology is, uh, or whether it's the technology that's being offered this is suit this new behavior um, in farm management practices in terms of the timeline I think 
it really depends again on the market. Are we looking at crop protection um, spraying drones or are we looking at remote sensing drones? Are we looking at specific crop types or industry areas? Um, and it really, really depends on a multifaceted um, angle as well as regulation, um, as well as aviation law. So I think from the timeline perspective, we should see a lot of emerging markets adopt this technology more quickly. But again, argued in our paper, we have to understand the whole ecosystem to understand the pace of adoption. There are going to be accelerators and there's going to be barriers. So we have to see what the whole balance looks like for each market or each market segment. We do see this being a very um, ideal technology to replace a lot of um, existing functional issues on the farms um, that might arise in certain markets in the future. So we do see um, more proliferation of drone usage in the future. Um, but in terms of widespread adoption, we, we're, we're quite interested and excited to see if there's any new accelerators out there um, for this technology.